Picture this. You're in a neatly organized clean kitchen. You have flour, eggs, milk, and sugar in front of you. How many things do you think you can make with just those four ingredients? So I got pancakes, crepes, because they're different, Yorkshire pudding, and waffles, so four. And clearly I was thinking small because ChatGBT came up with a lot more. Like donuts, I'd never have thought of that. And when I pushed for an exact number, it was clearly a slow afternoon. It turns out that because of the potential combinations and variations of recipes, the options are virtually limitless, which I love because it made me think of you and me and the way too many humans who limit who they are and who they could be to a very narrow set of options when the possibilities are virtually limitless. See, I came across the word selfhood a couple of years ago, and selfhood refers to the state or quality of being oneself. So it's essentially the combination of things that make up your unique identity. And what I love is that when you think about the ingredients that go into your selfhood, it includes things like this. So your personal characteristics, so they are personality traits like strengths and weaknesses, your life experiences, your beliefs and values, your emotions and feelings, your goals, the list goes on. And I don't know about you, but I'm a visual person, so I like to think of it like this, as it just gives me space. There's a sense of fluidity and flexibility when thinking about all that I am and all that I can be. So we live in a world where before you've taken your first breath, a lot of your identity has already been decided. So if we stick with our baking metaphor, based on things like your race, your gender, your nationality, your class, the experiences of your parents, it's already been decided if you're going to be a pancake, a muffin, or a crepe. And now, this doesn't always happen consciously, but what it means is that for many of us, we enter into the world already with expectations and assumptions on who we'll be. So you may have picked up on this already, but I'm mixed race. So my mom is white and my dad is black. So you could say that the world saw my mom as a pancake and my dad as a muffin, which I guess made me a flat muffin? I was the brown kid in black and white families. And if I looked around that clearly labeled bakery, I didn't fit. And as much as it perplexed me, it seemed to irritate others more as my mere existence was prodding at their neatly organized model of the world. And so when I was asked what I was, which yes, actually did happen quite a lot, it very quickly became apparent that there was a right and a wrong answer to that question. And my response would either result in acceptance or rejection. And see, they'd already constructed an image of who I was. Really, all they were asking was for me to confirm it. So I have this list on my phone of all the things I wish they taught us in school. And it's quite a long list. And this is one of them. So did you know that your adolescent years are the most instrumental in your identity development? So this is when you were anywhere between 12 to 19. And so according to psychologist Eric Erickson, there are eight developmental stages of development. And the one I want to focus in on is adolescence. So essentially what Erickson believes is that we get to a stage, we come through a conflict or a challenge that we need to overcome, and then we move through to the next stage. So in stage five, the challenge that we're working through is moving from childhood to adulthood. 
So it was essentially when you were trying to figure out who the adult version of you was. And you're also trying to find a place to fit or belong within society. And so just think back to your teenage years. Think back to the numerous questionable fashion trends, the work experience, the constantly talking about yourself, which is a little ironic. We count that as a lot to do with just being a teenager. And in many ways, it is. But in the world of psychology, it can also be understood as a stage of moratorium. So this is a stage where you are actively exploring things like your values, your beliefs, your behaviors, in order to establish a sense of identity. And it's something we should be doing throughout our lives, but we don't. Because there seems to be this silent assumption that when you become an adult, you should just know and stay who you are that the decisions you made when you were in adolescence should just guide you for the rest of your life, which is wild when you think about the fashion choices that 17-year-old you made. But it's true. That's how many of us live. Because do you know what the cousin of identity moratorium is? It's an identity crisis. Something that too often is met with judgment and shame. And I would know because I had one a couple of years ago. A messy, embarrassing, breakdown-shaped crisis that came to a head in the middle of a work meeting that unfortunately involved that ugly where you can't catch your breath <laughs> type of crying at work. See, what had happened was 17-year-old me had decided we were going to be in advertising. And we were. And we were good at it. And two months before my 29th birthday, I was made director of brand at an award-winning agency in downtown Toronto. So I was living 17-year-old me's dream life. The issue was that 29-year-old me was miserable. And you know something that we don't? talk enough about, how hard it can be when you feel awful, but everything around you is seemingly great. So my life, my job was wonderful. It was everything I'd wanted it to be. The issue was that it wasn't what this version of me wanted. And somewhere along the way, that decision I made at 17 started to feel like an identity straitjacket. And I hadn't noticed it before, but under the pressure of constantly repackaging myself for everybody else in the room, I was suffocating. And so I quit. And so there I am, celebrating my 30th birthday, broke, unemployed, and back at stage five. And I was sad and scared, but honestly, the main thing I felt was space. It was like being in that neatly organized, clean kitchen with the flour, the eggs, the milk, and the sugar. But the question I got to sit with was, what do I get to experiment with next? Who do I get to be next? I've been the part-time pancake, part-time muffin. What if this time I tried something new? And I did. In just the year that followed, I experimented with red hair, running, working abroad, officiating a wedding in Colombia, and finally starting that business that I've been talking about for the last five years. And yes, I won't lie, quitting my job was quite a big move but a lot of the actions that came next were small. They were small experiments with the ingredients in my selfhood. So my relationship with running started with me struggling my way for a 3K run. Building my business started with a really nervous Instagram post. 
And if you take only one thing away from this talk today, let it be this, that meeting more of the many versions of who you are doesn't require big, costly decisions. It requires a little bravery and the desire to live a life that feels good for you. Because do you know what the number one regret of the dying is? It's that I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life that others expected of me. And I can't help but wonder how many of those people entered the world as one thing and never had the opportunity to play with the possibilities. And I get it. Unlimited possibilities is a little bit overwhelming. Where do you start? So I started by learning, but not in a self-development kind of way. I call it self-deepening. So learning to rediscover and connect with different parts of myself. Somewhere along the way, I stopped reading. I guess I traded it in for Netflix and wrapped it up in the story that I only read when I'm on holiday. So I started to meet the version of me who read more. And somewhere in between picking up a good book or listening to a new podcast or stumbling across an interesting article, I changed mentally and physically. Because did you know that every time you learn something new, the physical structures and connections in your brain change. And so the next thing I wanted to do was try some stuff. So I was a chubby kid. 17-year-old me was deeply insecure of her body, the way that it looked, the way that it moved. So that identity we built hated exercise. PE was not my subject. And I guess it just stayed that way unchecked and unquestioned. And I'm someone who likes routine. So whilst I was loving being in that empty, free, clean kitchen, I was looking for a bit of structure. And so I decided to make it running. And I asked myself a question. What if I was the kind of person who loved to run? What would that version of me look, act, sound, feel like? And so slowly, those experiments I was doing with running became a routine. And that routine became a habit. And that habit became an identity. And on the 15th of October, almost exactly a year after my breakdown, I met the version of me who ran half marathons. And the people around me were noticing this. Of course they were. They were also having to meet these new versions of me. And we've been here before, right? Navigating the tension that can arise when you don't fit somebody else's model of the world. And it can be hard. And you have to make peace with the phrase, you've changed. But the easy thing about this time is that for once, you aren't confused about who you are. And that permission that you've given yourself to experiment and play with the many versions of you often inspires the people around you to do the same. See, these experiments, this journey is a personal one, but it doesn't have to be lonely. In fact, it shouldn't be lonely because the better you get at making space for the many versions of you, the better you are at holding space for the many versions of others. Meaning, you often become the kind of person who people want to be around more. So let's head back to the kitchen just once more. What do you want to make? And before you dive in with pricey marathon running shoes, I want to remind you that you have everything you need to start right now within you. When I think of your ingredients, I think of your selfhood. So start there. What if you turn up the heat? What is the metaphorical sugar that you could try reducing? And if you're someone like me who could benefit from a few guiding steps, use mine. So step one, learn something new. Order that book. 
Watch a documentary. Listen to a new podcast. Step two, explore or experiment with something. Try a new hobby, wear something new. Just listen to a new genre of music. And step three, discuss it with people. Is there someone in your life who you've seen make great changes recently? Why don't you ask them about it? And if you only follow these three simple steps, you'll end up baking something. And if nothing else, you'll get to meet an interesting new version of you. Thank you.